Welcome everyone. My name is Renee Duprell and I'm the Director of Development here at the Institute for Systems Biology. Thank you all for joining us today for ISB's Research Roundtable. This is part of our ongoing series to keep you up to date on our research. Our intention is to have one of these just about every month through the end of the year, so keep an eye out for our emails. Today we'll be hearing from our featured scientist, then there will be an opportunity for questions and answers after that. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and you're welcome to submit questions at any time. I'll be monitoring those and when Neha is done with her presentation, we'll move to the question and answer session and we'll work through those questions. And we do have a giveaway today. Someone in our audience will win this high quality ISB canvas tote bag. Uh, we will randomly generate a winner and we'll let you know who's the winner at the end of our Q&A session. Neha Subramanian is an associate professor at the Institute for Systems Biology and an affiliate assistant professor in the Department of Immunology and Department of Global Health at the University of Washington. She, reserved, she received her PhD in immunology from the National Institute of Immunology in New Delhi, India, and completed her postdoctoral training at the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. She's also won a number of awards for her research. Welcome, Neha. Hello, Renee. Thank Hello. You. <laughs> cool. So um, I guess it's over to me. And so if um, uh, I can, I'm just going to quickly go and sh go ahead and share my screen. And let me know if you can't see something. Um, if not, I will um, assume that everything looks good. So, okay, so I'm assuming everything looks good and I'm just gonna get started. Um, so thank you, Renee, and thank you, Audrey, for this opportunity to share my research um, with the community. Thanks for organizing these events. And uh, also a big thank you to everybody who's uh, joining us virtually today. Uh, thanks for taking the time to come and uh, come and listen to our uh, ongoing work. Um, so uh, Renee is correct. I uh, have studied immunology throughout the course of my career. And uh, for the longest time, I've worked on actually a very different set of infections, uh, mainly bacterial infections, like salmonella, to some degree viral infections and just the basic tenets uh, of the immune response. Um, and, um, it, you know, this was just a very lucky accident for me that when I came to ISB, um, I went down this road of Lyme disease. Um, and um, this was really a road less traveled for me at the time, but it's really opened um, our minds and our hearts uh, to this invisible disease. Um, so my journey in uh, Lyme disease actually began around 2016 when several different labs at ISB actually came together um, in a project that was led by uh, Lee Hood to really take a multi-pronged approach, um, which is really true to the name of systems biology uh, to tackle this disease. And it involved understanding both the host response as well as um, the biology of the pathogen that's Borrelia uh, that's responsible for this disease. Um, and uh, I will say that uh, although I am going to talk predominantly about the immune response, um, there are a lot of other experts at ISB um, who've been working in the biology of Lyme disease, both, both on the host and the pathogen. And so my lab is really not alone in this endeavor, and we've had um, the expertise of many of these people uh, to draw from. Um, so I'll start with quickly uh, thanking the people um, who've enabled this and people in the lab who've done this work as well as the funding agencies. Um, like I said, this project was originally led by, uh, by Lee Hood um, and uh, a very important player in this project is uh, Gary Wormser, who's been our clinical collaborator at New York Medical College um, and Mary Brunkow, who's the program manager um, handling um, this project. Uh, most of the work that I'm going to talk about today was done by uh, Clifford Rostomoli in my lab, who's, um, who's really almost single-handedly led this project um, with some help from Ajay uh, and Henry. And of course, a big thank you to the funding agencies. We've been fortunate um, to have been funded in this area. 
starting with uh, funding from uh, the Wilkie Family Foundation, that's Jeff and Liesl Wilkie, uh, the Cohen Foundation, the Global Lyme Alliance, the Washington Research Foundation, and most recently a pending grant uh, from the DOD. Um, so a big thank you to all of these funders who've enabled um, our work. Um, so let's start at the beginning. What is Lyme disease? At its most basic, it's actually a vector-borne disease caused by the bacterium Borrelia burgdorferi. And in this cartoon, you can see um, a tick biting the skin of an individual and transmitting um, this bacterium, which is essentially a spirochete. Um, it's transmitted uh, by ticks, as I just said, and it's transmitted mainly in the spring and the summer months. Um, and really during this time, the risk um, to humans uh, is the greatest. Um, but, the, but the pathogen that's Borrelia of itself has a really um, intricate life cycle that involves many different types of uh, hosts, which are both reservoir and non-reservoir hosts. A reservoir host is essentially a host that can carry the pathogen without getting sick and a non-reservoir host is a um, inadvertent uh, host that like humans that get bitten and that get the disease. Um, it's prevalent uh, in the Northeastern United States uh, mostly. There have been some cases reported even on the West Coast and uh, of course in the Midwest um, and really all over the world. Um, and this map shows you uh, by coloring uh, largely the endemic areas um, and it, it, what differs among these areas is the type of tick and to some degree the type of uh, Borrelia, this particular species and the type of um, co-infecting agent that can be transmitted. Um, and when the disease is first diagnosed, it generally manifests with this classic uh, bullseye rash. It's probably going to be, um, uh, this rash is going to be nothing new to people perhaps listening to this, um, uh, to my talk. Um, so really what's the impact uh, of Lyme disease? Um, the CDC actually estimates approximately 300,000 cases of Lyme disease annually in the US. And the cost of testing alone for seven laboratories in 2008 was estimated to be about uh, 492 million. Um, fast forward to 2019, the annual national economic impact is believed to be at about a 786 million. Um, in the US and many of these figures are li likely uh, underestimates at this point. Um, a big part of the equation, the societal cost basically, you know, the loss of productivity um, uh, of individuals can be really as impactful as the healthcare costs, but these societal costs are not even completely understood yet. Um, and some of the major challenges in this area remain that diagnosis and treatment is really a big problem. Um, to this date. Um, part of that is because um, the bullseye rash, basically um, the EM rash that I showed you, typically appears within two to 30 days after the tick bite, while the antibodies um, that most diagnostic tests measure to diagnose Borrelia infections appear approximately two to four weeks after the tick bite. And so um, a patient with EM can land up having uh, negative serological results or negative antibody results. And by the time they do get a positive test, they've you know, had either had other manifestations and um, just a range of other complex issues. Um, and finally, even though Lyme disease was first discovered in the early 1970s, um, there's no vaccine available um, uh, to date. And uh, this really tells us that some of the uh, current approaches that we've been taking to this disease um, haven't really been as impactful as as we hoped they would be. And I should say that of the research that has been done um, in the area uh, of uh, Lyme disease, um, a lot of it has been using uh, the mouse um, as a model system. And uh, you know, while mice are extremely important to understanding the basic biology of the disease, um, they are a natural reservoir. Um, oops, sorry. They are a natural uh, reservoir for Borrelia. And um, you know, they display an immune response that's very different uh, from the human host. Um, so of course, they look, they look different from humans, but there's also a basic difference in that one is a reservoir host in which the pathogen can survive and the other is a non-reservoir host. Um, 
The other issue is that laboratory strains of mice actually differ, uh, of, of Borrelia differ very widely uh, from the wild type Borrelia. The laboratory strains of Borrelia have actually lost a number of virulence plasmids uh, that alters their ability um, to cause disease. And so for that reason, again, you know, they can cause disease in mice, but those same strains are not going to cause disease in humans. And so what we learn from mice, we always have to take that with a grain of salt as to what it's telling us about the human disease. And of the human disease that have been done in this area, they've been static, um, not um, you know, at limited time points, and they've been relatively um, narrow in scope. So I'll tell you a little bit about the immune response to Borrelia. Um, so the skin is really the first site of, um, uh, of inf infection uh, because of course, uh, uh, Lyme disease does not happen in the absence of a tick bite, and it's also the first line of defense uh, against the pathogen. And so the immune cells in the skin are actually the first ones that encounter, uh, encounter Borrelia. And this really triggers an orchestrated immune response in the skin, um, engaging a series of cells uh, one after the other. Um, with starting with initial recognition uh, by keratinocytes and Langerhell cells depicted up here, and then an early response which engages uh, the eosinophils, neutrophils, and um, basophils, uh, followed by um, macrophages and dendritic cells, and then followed by um, really the T and the B cells, which come into the picture later on. That would be about um, uh, greater than 24 hours uh, after, uh, after the tick bite. Um, now, most of these cells in the skin and most immune cells um, in general, even in the periphery, that is in the blood, um, will respond by producing uh, a variety of um, uh, molecules that we call immune mediators. These are mainly cytokines or chemokines, and you can think about them as molecules that help cells to communicate with each other um, and really orchestrate this, uh, this ongoing response um, uh, to the pathogen. The other complication associated uh, with the tick bite is that the tick saliva can actually suppress skin immunity. The skin has an immune system, as I just showed you in the previous slide, uh, but the tick saliva actually contains a bunch of immunomodulatory proteins um, that can dampen um, this immunity. Um, it's known that the lymphotics must feed on the host for about two to three days um, in order for Borrelia to be transmitted. And Borrelia will be transmitted approximately 24 to 48 hours um, after, uh, after the tick uh, begins feeding. So the tick needs to stay attached to the host for an extended period of time um, for, uh, for Borrelia to be transmitted. And this is where um, you know, we as humans have the opportunity um, to really um, uh, prevent this infection from taking hold by making sure that um, we check ourselves for ticks after going outside and promptly um, remove them. I'll talk about that a little bit more um, um, a bit later. The other interesting thing about Borrelia is um, that it is very highly motile and I hope I can play this movie. This actually shows Borrelia moving uh, within a blood vessel. And uh, it's known that the pathogen can eventually escape from the vasculature. And this can be one uh, mechanism by which it can um, uh, really uh, transmit itself or migrate uh, throughout the body. And uh, this motility of Borrelia is really due to its classical spirochete shape, essentially. And um, these really nanomotors or nanomachines, which we call uh, flagella in the pathogen. So you can think about the bacterium as this kind of corkscrew kind of mechanism moving in this um, spirally oriented manner, using these little nanomachines to propel itself forward uh, through the bloodstream and the vasculature. And when Borrelia does get to systemic sites, um, well, it causes a bunch of problems. Um, a normal joint can land up looking something like this, where you get recruitment of a bunch of different immune cells um, into the joints. Um, and that basically leads to um, a lot of inflammation and some of the joint issues associated with Lyme disease. But the bacterium can also get to other systemic sites. Uh, these include um, the heart, which has been associated with cardiac Lyme, the nervous system associated with neuroborreliosis or neurolyme 
and also to the lymph nodes. And this can lead to general disruption um, of the adaptive immune response uh, uh, that can be mounted by the body. The other challenge associated with Lyme disease is that although most patients upon detecting the EM rash go on antibiotics and resolve disease, a subset of patients actually develop what is called post-treatment Lyme disease uh, symptoms or PTLDS. And the manifestation of PTLDS is really heterogeneous um, among individuals, commonly includes things like fatigue, prolonged arthritis, and lingering neurological complaints. Um, and what you can see here on this graph really is, if you look at the um, black part of the bars, that is the severe, um, uh, severe complaints. They are most commonly found in individuals that have PTLDS. Um, and you'll also notice that these are really, um, some of these complaints are really commonplace essentially, but still you see a difference between the controls and PTLDS patients indicating that there is something uh, linked to Lyme disease here. And these were, of course, individuals, PDLDS individuals, or those individuals in which Borrelia was found and diagnosed and basically found to be present in them. Um, and they were treated with antibiotics for it. And the other thing you'll notice is that the symptoms are really heterogeneous in nature, um, you know, ranging from joint issues to memory issues, um, um, to facial palsy, just visual issues, and so on and so forth. So what is causing all of these problems? And there are basically two hypotheses out there about what could be going on um, in PDLDS. One is uh, perhaps the presence of persistent antigen, but a lot of studies have shown that viral bacteria actually do not persist after antibiotic treatment. Um, but it's also been shown that bacterial antigen can, these could be fragments of the pathogen, for instance, and we don't exactly yet understand whether they can cause any continued disruption in terms of the symptoms that, that are reported in these patients um, or um, you know, modulate the immune response in any way. The other uh, hypothesis out there is autoimmunity. And in support of this, many autoantibodies have been found in patients with Lyme disease. Um, these include um, basically antibodies against self antigens. Um, so you can think of this as the immune system starting to, starting to attack itself, which is causing some of these uh, systemic uh, complications. So the one thing that's clear uh, from the current literature is um, that you know, Lyme disease exists. Um, it is uh, difficult to diagnose. We have no vaccine against the disease. There's a subset of people who proceed to post-treatment disease. Um, we do not quite understand what the mechanism underlying uh, this prolonged disease is. And so it's becoming increasingly clear that current approaches are actually not working and that a new approach is needed to, um, needed to fight the disease. And so, uh, our approach in this area has actually been um, to follow individuals longitudinally over time, not to do static studies, but to follow each individual over time from, from the time the person is diagnosed with acute disease to the time that person goes on antibiotics and, uh, and up to one year uh, after that, essentially. Um, and in these individuals, um, we've been measuring a lot of different things at ISP. I'll be focusing here on the immune response. And what we've measured um, to understand the immune response is circulating mediators, the things like cytokines and chemokines that I just told you about a few slides ago. And then we're measuring uh, the immune cells that are present in the blood of these individuals and what changes are happening in their immune cells in terms of um, their activation states um, and so on. Um, however, Borrelia uh, infection actually originates in the skin. So the skin is the site of infection and looking in the blood actually cannot always give us a complete picture as to what's going on at the site of uh, tick bite. Um, however, it's very difficult to get skin samples <laughs> from people. Um, it, it, you know, it's uh, hard, sometimes difficult to get through IRBs in terms of approvals to get re uh, repeated punch biopsies from individuals. And so this first uh, phase of our study, um, we wanted to study the skin, but we resorted to public data. So we used meta-analysis of the public data that was already out there and tried to integrate that um, with the findings that we're getting from the blood. And finally, we are trying to integrate both of the information that are getting from the blood and that we're getting from the skin with clinical information 
Um, that is how a person behaves in terms of his or her diagnosis, what their symptoms were by using standardized questionnaires, um, the serology, were they, what tests were they positive for, what the co-infecting agents were, and so on. And we've got a, um, a big set of clinical information um, on these individuals. So I'm now gonna to try to um, summarize five years of work in probably five slides. Um, so bear with me and feel free to ask any questions uh, that, uh, that may arise in the, uh, in the chat box. Um, so one thing that we observe, uh, which probably will be no surprise to anyone is that patients display heterogeneous symptoms at diagnosis. Um, and I won't read these out to you, uh, but you can just see that it ranges again from ankle pain to um, decreased appetite to concentration issues and so on. Um, however, most of these symptoms, or at least their frequency decreases rapidly after antibiotic treatment. And by six months post-infection um, or post-diagnosis, most of the individuals have actually um, resolved their symptoms. Now, at the time when in the, uh, symptoms are high in these individuals and and at many time, other time points later on, we also measured um, immune proteins in the blood of these individuals. And what we find is um, that um, at, at T1, which is at the time of diagnosis, the subset of proteins that are colored in blue here are actually upregulated in patients compared to controls, or they're higher in patients compared to controls. And after treatment with antibiotics, um, that's two weeks later, most of this immune signature um, is resolved. Most of these proteins go back to baseline levels. And by six months and one year, again, there's hardly any circulating signature um, uh, left in these patients when you compare them to controls. Um, the other interesting thing is that symptom severity um, actually correlates with host protein levels. So how, um, in, how severe your symptoms are is directly related. Um, to the levels of your protein. So the worse your symptoms, the higher the levels of these circulating um, inflammatory immune mediators um, in your blood. Um, and this is basically a circus plot. I'm not going to dig too deep into it, but all I want you to see is that um, the symptom score, for instance, is connected by these red lines to a bunch of different cytokines. Uh, the really interesting ones here are interferon gamma, CXCL 10 and 11 um, uh, and 9. Um, which, are, which are linked to the severity of the disease. And, um, and these are all positive correlations. So the red lines are all positive correlations, the blue lines are negative correlations. And we've parsed down this circus plot for sanity just to uh, show you the correl correlations that we think uh, are potentially biologically important. However, I should say that you know, in, in human studies, we typically compare patients with controls. However, every patient actually is unique. And I'm talking about these levels of circulating mediators in the blood, but the truth is every individual has his or her own baseline for these circulating mediators in the blood. Um, and by comparing patients to controls, sometimes we tend to lose biological information because their homeostatic uh, baselines are just different. Um, and so we went ahead and did a different kind of analysis. And this basically, we compare each patient to his or her own self um, over time, from the time of diagnosis um, out, until, um, out until one year. And when we do this, we find that uh, the proteins in patients um, generally follow two trajectories. Um, one is a set of fast resolving proteins, which are in the top. Um, in pink, and the other is a slow resolving proteins, which are at the bottom uh, in blue. And what I mean by fast resolving is that these proteins, if you look at this curve, are up at baseline, but they rapidly decrease by two weeks after antibiotic treatment, and then they basically just float around the baseline. Um, so these proteins are increased early on, and then they just go down very fast after antibiotic treatment. The slow resolving signature on the other hand, these proteins go down slightly after antibiotic treatment, um, but not completely. And they keep going down until about six months uh, post antibiotic treatment. Um, so so they, they tend to linger on, if you will, after about two weeks, um, and they are gradually cleared from the bloodstream uh, by about six months. 
Um, and we're trying to figure out more by correlating these trajectories with different um, clinical data as to uh, whether they're actually able to parse out individuals um, into, um, into interesting uh, categories. Uh, but we've gone ahead and actually done modeling um, using all of this circulating mediator protein data um, and try to ask, can we discriminate patients from proteins, uh, patients from controls using this protein data? And the reason for that is if we can develop an effective classifier or effective set of proteins that can discriminate patients from controls, um, then that would mean that we could develop diagnostics that can uh, detect the disease earlier, earlier on um, as compared to, the, uh, compared to the tests that are currently available uh, out there. And so when we did this kind of modeling, we saw that a set of about five proteins can actually distinguish patients from controls at the time of diagnosis um, and also at two weeks uh, post-diagnosis. And the accuracy of this model uh, was, about, uh, was about 71%. Um, and this is overall promising considering the sample size, the variability in the immune response, and the duration of the infection across different individuals, right? It's a highly heterogeneous. Um, uh, Lyme disease patients are highly heterogeneous. And part of the reason for that is um, that the time of tick bite in most patients is not known. The time of tick bite is probably when your immune response starts, but by the time patients show up at the clinic, they can potentially be in different phases of their immune response because they don't know when the tick actually bit them. And the rash uh, that's used for diagnosis actually appears about um, uh, three to 30 days after the tick bite. So a patient could potentially be coming into the clinic any time between three to 30 days after they got the tick bite. And that, that, that leads to heterogeneity um, in the immune response. And so the fact that, that we can use this protein data to classify patients uh, with about 70% accuracy was encouraging. And we think that by integrating more of the data that we're getting from the immune cell populations, we can uh, build a more robust classifier um, uh, or potentially a more robust diagnostic, immune-based diagnostic, I should say, um, of Lyme disease. So that's it for the circulating proteins. Um, the next thing that we did was um, we measured uh, immune populations in the blood of these individuals, and we measured their activation states. So things like T cells, B cells, macrophages that I showed you in one of the previous cartoons. And really what's most striking here is that we measured about 45 different immune populations in the blood of these patients. And we find that there's really a striking lack of peripheral immune activation in Lyme disease patients. And when I say peripheral immune activation, basically means activation of the immune cells that are circulating, um, that are circulating in the blood. Um, the one thing that we consistently saw across patients um, uh, at the time of diagnosis was that these uh, cells called plasma blasts were uh, upregulated. These are a kind of uh, B cells that can go on um, when they mature to produce, uh, produce antibodies. Um, and we know that that antibodies can be detected uh, during Lyme disease. Of course, um, as you know, that's the, one of the diagnostics used to diagnose Lyme disease, although it's not a very effective one. However, if we look at across all the other um, 44 different immune populations, there's starkly really not much going on. Um, and, and there's not much going on in the periphery of patients, regardless of how severe their symptoms are. In fact, we've detected, um, and I'm showing you um, a sampling of three different immune populations here to show you that really there's not a lot of change happening across these populations between patients and controls, except for one patient. This patient colored here in red had 35 EM rashes over his or her body. Almost feel, felt like this person might have fallen into a tick bush or something. Um, and this person also has disseminated disease. When you have that many rashes over your body, you know, you're getting immune activation at many different lymph nodes in your body. And essentially you start getting, um, of course, a pathogen is also able to move to systemic sites and you start getting a robust immune response, but you also start getting disseminated um, uh, disease. And so this um, was, really, uh, was really striking to us. Um, that there's just negligible immune activation occurring um, in the blood. And I'm showing this to you uh, just here in a circus plot. Um, the, 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 
the person with the 35 EM rashes is colored in red here. And what you can again see is that they have very high levels of, of these two different types of immune populations. So anything above, above the second circle in this wheel, if you will, um, is significant um, and, uh, and is significantly upregulated. But really this patient is an outlier in terms of his or her immune activation. Seems like here the immune system has just gone into alarm mode. But if you see a lot of the other patients, there's not a lot going on, the ones that are colored in gray, except for the occasional spike you see in this patient, for instance, or this patient or this patient, but those are again few and, um, um, and far between. So um, <laughs> what, what could this potentially mean? We're still trying to figure out the mechanism of, of why we see this uh, lack of immune activation um, in the blood of individuals. But I will leave, leave you with this thought and we're still trying to, as we're still trying to think through this ourselves, uh, one role of the peripheral immune system is really in immunosurveillance. That is to survey the body for pathogens that could gain access to circulation and to, and to distal sites within the body, things like the central nervous system, things like the sites like the joints, for instance. Um, and, uh, and it seems that that does not actually happen in Lyme disease. And so one, um, one potential implication of that, we don't know whether it's true or not right now because, because it requires more testing, but one potential implication is um, that any Borrelia that, that actually falls through the cracks during the first course of antibiotics and gains access to systemic sites, um, such as the joints or the central nervous system, can go undetected by the peripheral immune system. And that um, could potentially be one, re one reason as to why um, a subset of individuals um, proceed to these um, long-term uh, kind of system, uh, symptoms because you're just not getting good, uh, good immunity in the periphery. Having said that, um, there's another kind of immunity, uh, the antigen-specific immunity, you know, that makes vaccines work. Um, it's known that antigen-specific cells do reach the periphery and that they can traffic back to the site of infection. And so we're still trying to think through this a little bit more um, as to what that means. Is it just the threshold of the number of cells that's required um, to be in the periphery or what actually um, is going on here? And um, uh, we're also trying to actually look within these, uh, we would like to look within these PBMCs or these uh, peripheral immune cells um, and really look at the gene expression in these cells to see what kind of genes are getting activated in these cells. You know, is it um, is it that they're activating a bunch of repressive genes or what's actually um, functionally what's going on there? Um, and uh, we, we're also trying to try think through and uh, do some public data analysis to figure out if, there's a, if this is a general theme for spirochete infections um, or and skin diseases. Um, some of the data out there suggests that it may be, but others suggest that it may not be. Um, and so we're still uh, trying to work through that. So, um, uh, you know, this cohort has to date really given us important insights into the biology um, of acute disease. I just described one of the insights to you today. Um, and it's helped us identify immune-based discriminators of patients and controls, like I mentioned. Um, and one of the other things we're going to do on these patients is directly measure um, the autoimmune response in these patients to see um, if and when autoimmunity is detectable um, in these individuals. However, there are limitations of this cohort, and that is that we had only about 50 uh, patients, which means that there aren't um, a lot of individuals with PTLDS. And uh, the study of PDLDS really requires larger cohorts. And I, I think with these data, we're just beginning to scratch the surface in terms of understanding mechanistically what could be um, going on um, in Lyme disease. Um, so before I uh, describe to you what we're gonna do next um, and uh, uh, go to some of our future directions and new cohorts, I, I'd like to touch upon an issue um, that, that I haven't addressed so far, and that's actually quite contentiously <laughs> Called, uh, called chronic Lyme disease. Um, and uh, so basically what, what is chronic Lyme disease? Uh, this essentially refers uh, to a heterogeneous uh, group of illnesses. Um, and uh, when I say heterogeneous, um, I, I go back to this reference that was uh, published in 1990 and it's striking that there hasn't been a lot of work on this disease. 
um, in, in recent years. But essentially, this can encompass um, patients that have either untreated Lyme disease, that is early Lyme disease or EM rash, or late, uh, untreated late Lyme disease involving uh, complications of the joints and uh, nervous system. Um, it can include individuals um, who, who have symptoms that are probably related to earlier Lyme disease, which means it could be Lyme that occur, reoccurred in these individuals, or they have residual symptoms post-treatment. So some of the PTLDS individuals that I was just describing to you. And they can also be some individuals who had fibromyalgia after documented Lyme disease. So they had Lyme disease, they resolved it, and now they, they have fibromyalgia, but somehow they're falling in the, in the chronic Lyme uh, category. And, and finally, it also includes individuals who actually have no prior documented history of Lyme disease. And this could be due to several reasons, because I, as I mentioned that you know, some of the diagnostics that we use for this disease are currently are inadequate. Um, but uh, it's included individuals that have fibromyalgia unrelated to Lyme, uh, that have had other diagnoses, such as rheumatoid arthritis, spondylosis, uh, spondylosis or osteoarthritis and just other medically unexplained symptoms. But because no Borrelia has ever been detected in these individuals, um, it's, it's been difficult to say that, that, that they actually have Lyme disease. And you know, this is only confounded by the fact that there's actually no reliable marker for prior exposure to Lyme disease. And so that makes it really difficult to diagnose a subset of PTLDS individuals um, with, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of differentiate between PDLDS individuals and chronic Lyme because PDLDS individuals have definitely seen the pathogen before, um, but you know, because there's no reliable marker for disease exposure, it's just hard to uh, differentiate those categories and say whether chronic individuals, people who think they have chronic disease, actually had uh, post-treatment disease or not. And so, so currently, this <laughs> tackling uh, this this really complex problem. Um, really requires a good diagnostic approach that, uh, that's based on taking a good history, really listening to the patient's symptoms, establishing a history of past Lyme illness, follow, uh, understanding what their treatment history was, you know, what kind of therapeutics did they take, um, and really, most importantly, excluding um, other diagnoses. And you know, because of all of this confusion about how the term chronic Lyme disease has been employed, um, and really the lack of a clearly defined clinical definition, uh, many experts in the field actually do not support uh, the use of uh, chronic disease. And as perhaps many of you will know, it's, it's, it's a really politically and uh, medically <laughs> charged, uh, uh, charged issue. Um, so let me describe to you some of the efforts that we are um, that we're going to take in the future um, to try to get at both the um, acute phase disease as well as uh, the long-term disease. Um, so what I described to you earlier today in terms of the preliminary data was a self-contained cohort of about 50 individuals, and we're still working on this cohort. Um, uh, uh, and, and we're also setting up new cohorts because the current cohort, unfortunately, doesn't have a lot of people who have post-treatment disease. And also, if you want to really um, find robust biomarkers um, or diagnostics uh, for acute disease, you definitely need an independent cohort to validate those findings and just a much larger number of patients compared to the 50 patients that we've, uh, we've had so far. And so... Um, to, to really get at the next phase of this study um, in, in collaboration um, with, uh, with Lee and uh, Jim at ISB and our clinical partners, that's Rocco Monto and John Ockard, we're planning to include, uh, to, to include three cohorts. Um, and, and these, uh, we are trying to recruit on the island uh, of, uh, of Nantucket. Um, so <laughs> many of you might have actually heard about Nantucket. It's a hotbed for Lyme disease, and that's largely due to its population of deer and mice. And you know, it's uh, it's climate, of course, that drives uh, uh, that that drives and supports the tick population. In addition to these, um, uh, in addition to the hosts like the deers and mice that are available for the ticks to feed on, and 
quite strikingly, Lyme disease actually accounts for about 71% of all the infectious disease um, on, uh, on Nantucket. Um, and it's really most common at the state level um, uh, in Massachusetts and in, uh, in, in Nantucket. Um, so what are we planning to do here? What are our cohorts? Um, we're recruiting three, uh, hoping to recruit three kinds of cohorts. And this uh, study is really still in the planning phase. Um, one is individuals um, who would have new Lyme disease diagnosis. And so these would be something akin to the prospective cohort I just described to you. So these would be individuals um, who come into the clinic at the time when they see, uh, when they have symptoms or they have a, they have a tick bite and, uh, and the associated EM rash, um, we diagnose them and they, um, a subset of these uh, will hopefully return to normal health and a subset of these will uh, likely proceed to persistent symptoms. Uh, but we're planning to scale up the numbers uh, much more here so that um, we can really catch these individuals with persistent symptoms. And at the time of diagnosis, all of these individuals uh, will go on antibiotics. Um, and so what do we want to do with this cohort? Here, we, we want to do really a multitude of measurements. I described only the immune measurements to you so far. Um, but here we're going to hoping to uh, we're hoping to look at really um, dense dynamic data clouds, essentially, um, you know, as as Lee Hood calls them, which is collect information from these individuals um, essentially at all levels, at the genomic level, at the cellular level, uh, at the organ level, and integrate that uh, with clinical uh, metadata. So really everything from beginning to end uh, to start to understand. Um, what's happening in these individuals and integrate all of that with blood chemistries, um, things like uh, the Fitbit, um, where we'll monitor their sleep. So we're really hoping to collect a lot of information on these people from, um, uh, from soup to nuts. And um, we hope to be able to integrate these measurements with clinical information to really build better diagnostics and prognostics based not on one or two measurements, but really a multitude of measurements. And, uh, really build predictive models of disease progression. Um, and we think these patient numbers are going to add a lot of robustness um, to our ability to be able to do that. Um, so the second cohort uh, that, that we're hoping to recruit is the never, never Lyme cohort. And these are basically people who are healthy people. We hope to recruit them from the healthy population. And uh, we hope to collect and bank their blood until Lyme disease is, uh, is suspected in them. And if diagnosed, um, again, they hopefully will follow the same trajectory. Some will move on to persistent disease, some will return to health. Um, and if, uh, if they are diagnosed, then we'll follow the same set of assays that I just described to you. But one really important feature of this cohort is that we get to understand what these patient baselines look like. Like I told you, people come into the clinic um, at multiple different times. And we never completely understand what the baseline immune response of that individual was or what the baseline, immune, baseline state of that individual for many different measurements was. And so we can never completely say whether after antibiotics, people return to the true baseline state or some kind of an altered <laughs> state, essentially. And this cohort will enable us to um, hopefully tease that out. And the third cohort is actually um, the persistent Lyme cohort. Um, this cohort perhaps comes the closest to what, uh, to, to chronic disease. And we really have to work very carefully with our clinical partners um, uh, to come up with clinical definitions uh, for this. And we're heavily relying on the expertise of, um, of uh, the clinicians at Johns Hopkins and Nantucket um, in this area. And here, really at its most basic, the question we're going to ask is, you know, what, what, are, what are these individuals? What's going on in these individuals? I described to you that persist, the persistent Lyme cohort can just be very highly heterogeneous, ranging from PTLDS to people who have primary Lyme disease to people who potentially have other kinds of sim symptoms. And so using the same strategy of uh, gathering a multitude of information at different scales, we hope to come up with a molecular stratification of these individuals to really characterize at the levels of genes and cells what's going on in these people who have, uh, who have different, been diagnosed with different um, uh, types of manifestations. 
So I'll leave you with that. Um, this is where we're going. But in the meantime, um, what can we all do to stop this hidden epidemic while we're still searching for answers as to how this disease works and we're still looking for better diagnostics and prognostics. And you know, here I'd reckon that really prevention is the best form of cure. Um, and especially in the endemic areas, um, you have to be aware of ticks, um, wearing insect repellent, um, you know, wearing light clothing uh, with trousers tucked inside socks so you look like a dork, uh, but at least you don't get Lyme disease. Um, you know, to keep away from tall grasses where ticks can climb up and bite you. Um, to check for ticks regularly, really, in areas like the armpits and, um, you know, behind your knees, um, where, where they tend to hide away very efficiently to take a shower after, after being outdoors. And, and also, um, you know, there's a huge laundry list of things you can do, but perhaps one of the most important ones, in addition to these, is to, to carefully remove, if you observe a tick, to carefully remove it, but to remove it with a tweezer, not with your hands. And if you can, um, save the tick, because that can then be tested for, uh, for co-infecting agents and uh, uh, you know, give the clinicians a better, uh, better confidence in, um, in, what, in what, what you actually have, should you proceed to any kind of symptoms. And of course, if you, if you experience any kind of symptoms uh, like a fever or a rash, you should, uh, you should see the physician. Um, so with that, I will um, wrap up and acknowledge the people. I've already mentioned um, a lot of them along the way, uh, but thanks to all the people who've helped plan this study, um, all the funders, um, and uh, finally, I should mention that our lab is recruiting right now. And so, um, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that we work on Lyme disease and this has become an area uh, that we're very passionate about. Uh, but we also work on other kinds of uh, studying the immune response to other kinds of diseases. So if you're interested in any of that, um, check us out. And, uh, and most recently, we've arrived on Twitter. So you can also follow our work there. So um, with that, I will um, stop talking, Renee, <laughs> and see if you, you or anyone has any questions. Um, I'm happy to answer any. Great. Thanks, Neha. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, good. Um, so we do have um, some questions, and I'll get those going right away. Um, can you speculate on why the disease was not characterized until the 1970s. Um, any estimate for how long the disease has been infecting humans? Oh man, um, why it was not characterized um, earlier than the 1970s? I actually don't know, um, uh, you know, why it was not, uh, why we didn't study it earlier than that. Um, it, you know, a lot of pathogens actually co-evolve uh, and adapt to their hosts over time. I don't think there was any kind of firm timeline. Um, you know, this probably started before the 1970s. And so, yeah. um, you know, prior to the time we got, we got a hold on it, but I think we probably got a hold on it when, um, well, firstly, when somebody actually starts researching it. So William Bergdorfer, um, yeah. you know, really <laughs> dedicated a lot of time and effort to it. But also when, um, you know, disease is propagated in the environment, um, uh, but, but, you know, as long as they don't infect humans, we actually don't quite, quite look into them. So, so not sure what exactly the answer there is, but that's what my speculation is. Okay, great. Um, is there any evidence of increasing antibiotic resistance being a problem for Lyme disease? Oh, um, <laughs> yes. I mean, I don't know that there's any firm data out there, but uh, persisters have been reported in Lyme disease. We most often think of persisters as, um, uh, as bacteria that are, um, you know, that, are, that are resistant to antibiotics or have adapted to the human host. Mm -hmm. One issue with Lyme disease though, and you know, especially people who have heterogeneous manifestations of Lyme, is that um, you know they go on antibiotics for for a very long period of time, and so that's also one of the uh, and antibiotics can have other detrimental effects, right? They can uh, they can affect your microbiome and so on and so forth, and and so so definitely I think antibiotics are cultivating likely cultivating resistance uh, in in Borrelia, although 
um, you, you know, there, there are few labs uh, studying this um, and uh, they, they have found persisters, but they haven't been documented in the human hosts yet. Okay. Um, what proportion of newly diagnosed patients do you expect to exhibit persistent symptoms? Oh, interesting question. Yeah, it is. I actually do not know. Yeah. Um, well, persistent, I guess the question is, if the question is what percentage of uh, people diagnosed with Lyme disease uh, with the EM rash go on to get persistent symptoms, that would be about 10 to 20%, essentially. But I know I described a bunch of different cohorts, so I'm not exactly sure what, what the person is trying to get at here. But if you are diagnosed with an EM rash, there's a, there's an 80 to 90 percent chance that you're going to clear the infection in response to antibiotics, and only about uh, 10 to 20 percent individuals will go on to develop uh, the persistent form of disease. And by persistent, okay. here I mean the post-treatment form of the disease. Right. Okay. I think that's probably what this person meant. Yeah. Cool. That's what I would have wanted to know anyway. <laughs> um, what's the current situation in vaccine development for Lyme? Not very good, okay. actually. Okay. You know, there was one vaccine, Lymerix, that was uh, licensed actually several years ago, but it, uh, it ran into a lot of troubles. I think some people had side effects, and even though it was partially effective in other people, it just ran into a lot of uh, political problems. And so it was withdrawn from the market. And, uh, you know, that's where we need to go. We need new ideas, new approaches, big science, because um, we, we need a vaccine for Lyme disease, especially in these endemic areas. We do, we do. And, you know, the, um, I, I loved your description of the work that you're doing in Nantucket, because that's such a special and unique um, study that you're doing. And I know it kind of got put on the back burner with COVID. Yes. Can you talk, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so, you know, technically yeah. this study was supposed to begin recruiting uh, in, in spring of 2020, but then, hey, yeah. you know, spring of 2020, who knew what was coming then? Right. Um, and COVID struck, and then, you're right, this got put on the back burner, and a lot of our resources uh, got uh, um, reassigned to COVID, I presume. And so, you know, that's actually put these cohorts on hold. And so, um, you know, we need, um, and, and, you know, we need good research. I was going to say for good reason, because COVID is a pandemic after yeah. all. But, yeah. you know, Lyme disease is also an invisible pandemic. We, we don't completely understand its societal impact, essentially. And, uh, and it's been relegated to the shadows for a long time. It's been, uh, it's been understudied, although it's really encouraging to see more government funding uh, uh, go into this. Um, uh, so, yes, the impact of COVID has been that, you know, Lyme has... Uh, is on the back burner and uh, we're hoping that as and when we can raise resources um, to really recruit the uh, uh, cohorts and the numbers of patients that that we want um, that that would be able to start the recruiting mm -hmm. okay great i know that's a, it's, a, it's an exciting program so i'm glad it's it's going to start moving forward again um, what are the most promising ways to search for potential markers for a prior exposure to lyme For a prior exposure to Lyme, um, you know, it is, um, so, so most, most pathogens will induce a form of uh, immunity called adaptive immunity, um, mm -hmm. which is your TNB cells. And that's why when you get, you know, for instance, if you get measles once, you don't get it again because you have uh, adapt, uh, not adapt, an adaptive immune system. You have uh, T and B cells that, that actually go and attack the pathogen and uh, or the virus or whatever in this case and, uh, and essentially uh, 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 and, and clear it. Um, and uh, so, you know, if we could actually figure out um, <laughs> antigen specific immunity um, to Borrelia and really sequence, uh, figure out, um, you know, there's something called TCR and BCR sequencing, which actually can identify antigen specific um, Borrelia specific T and B cell clones. Uh, that is now included um, in our Nantucket study. Um, if we're able to get at that and we're able to figure out um, uh, really Borrelia reactive immune cells, um, I think that would be an effective um, marker. 
or uh, diagnostic for previous exposure to Lyme. And that's part of the reason we're trying to do these uh, sequencing studies. Great, great. Uh, last question. Um, do other previous infections such as mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, EBV affect the expression of those specific proteins? Um, the protein, the circulating proteins that I showed, I don't know. Um, we, we haven't looked at that. And that's uh, actually a very good question because that's what we want to do. Um, you know, we found a signature that, that is upregulated in, um, that's upregulated in Lyme disease patients um, mm. in their blood. Now the question really is, um, is it specific to Lyme disease or are you going to see it upregulated in other diseases as well? Um, okay. and, and that is what we're trying to get at now. We're trying to do, um, uh, you know, utilize public data that's available from these diseases um, and, and really compare it with the data we have to see are these proteins going up in other heterogeneous types of infections as well or are they specific to Lyme? And if they are, then, you know, that gives us a good diagnostic and a specific tool. Okay, great. Thank you, Neha. Thank you, Renee, and thanks yeah. to everybody uh, who joined today. Yeah. Um, so we have a few more um, housekeeping items. We have a lucky winner of our ISB tote bag, and that's Bill Noble. And it's not because he asked the most questions. He was the randomly generated winner. So congratulations, Bill. We'll connect with you and get you your tote bag. And of course, our next research roundtable is you can always find those at isbevents.org. That's our website page for our events. And the next one is September 21st, and it's at 3.30. It's with Andrew Magus, and he'll be talking about identifying biomarkers for cancer years before diagnosis. So that'll be an interesting one. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Neha, and um, hopefully we'll see you all in September. Thank mm -hmm. you.